Hi friends, it's time to start this week's open studio stream. Let me just give me a minute because I also am going to concurrently broadcast on IGTV, or at least I'm going to try to. Last week it was unsuccessful because my phone wouldn't connect to um, the Wi-Fi for some reason. But I'd like to stream both places, so just give me one minute while I start the stream over here. It's checking the connection. I'm now live. I'm now live. Great. I'm in both places now, YouTube and uh, IGTV. Hi, Arlene. I see Arlene is in the chat on YouTube, and I see that uh, Hats Period has showed up in the chat, and uh, Stacy Payne also on Instagram Live. So um, thank you for joining me today. Welcome. I am streaming from my studio at home here in Durham, North Carolina, and I had set it up earlier. I had set up a trying to get a convention going where I have an Instagram story where people can vote between choose between two different topics of what I'm going to work on in my open studio stream. Since I'm normally a theatrical milliner for Playmakers Repertory Company in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but our season has moved entirely online. It's largely contemporary plays and radio plays, and so costume-wise, there's not so many challenges for me. Um, but I do still have a list of projects that I'm working on for a number of other purposes. Nonprofits like the Crepe Myrtle Festival is holding a charity auction since this year they can't hold the festival due to the pandemic. And um, I made a hat for entry in an art exhibit sponsored by WCPE, the classical station. And I have been the past couple studio streams working on a spiral straw Regency bonnet, which behind me here, this is the project basket that contains all of the strip straw that I've been using on that. And in fact, you can see that the bonnet crown is in process right here. I got this far on last week's studio stream. And when I, vo I had the vote this week, it was to do more of that spiral straw, which is essentially what I've been working on for the past two weeks um, on this Regency bonnet that's going to be a, a teaching sample for a lecture I'm giving in March for a lifelong learning program on millinery and other uh, accessories in the time of Jane Austen. Um, but, so I had my vote, and technically speaking, the majority went for more Regency Bonnet, but I teach a graduate class in millinery this semester and more of my students voted for the other option, which is blocking and straw cloth. And because I originally started this open studio stream as a means for them to be able to just watch me working and, and learn with the, the kind of camaraderie that you have when you share a studio with someone, which we can't safely do right now. I thought it would behoove me to, to listen to my students um, and, and do a blocking project this week. Now, I don't know, but I suspect that it won't take me the whole hour. This studio stream runs until 4 p.m. And um, I've blocked with straw cloth before and there's a, a, a period of working with it and then it needs to sit and dry out. And if I were at work in the studio at the theater, I could bake it in a very low temperature level of, the, uh, I have an oven in there that's not for baking pizzas, it's for um, speeding up the evaporation of hat sizing and anything that you need it to evaporate quickly. Um, and putting a fan on it is not going to be as helpful as putting dry heat on it and put it in that oven. Which, so I might do that or put a fan on it if I were working at that studio, but I'm here at home, my home studio, this millinery table that I'm at right now is, you can see behind me, this is the bed in our guest room in the front of the house. Gets the great um, lighting from this window, so it's a wonderful place to be working on hats. Um, but it's not, there's not a lot of the same kind of space and equipment that I have at work. I have a hat steamer right behind you guys, 
and I have a whole bunch of, of head blocks and hat blocks both stored underneath this table and on a bookshelf here off to the right. Um, but sadly, I don't have a way to, I, I don't have an oven dedicated to baking blocked hats. So um, I, I'm probably going to get this to a certain point where the straw cloth is stretched over it and pinned in place. And um, then I'm just gonna need to move on to something else. So we'll see. I'm working with a block that I got from a woman who was selling off the contents, well, not the entire contents, but she was selling off a, a certain amount of her millinery studio supplies and equipment um, early in the pandemic. And she created a, a list of milliners on one of the professional milliners Facebook groups there. She created a list of us that she would send out an email when she had added something new for sale. And you just would get the notification and try to get it if you wanted it. And this weird block was one that I managed to get. Now it is, it's made, it's a custom block made, well, maybe it's not custom. I mean, I've never seen this shape before as a hat block, but who knows. It, it's made by, if you can see this, Blocks by Design, which is a hat block company. I believe Blocks by Design is in Australia, but I could be wrong. They might be in the UK. I have to look that up. Or maybe one of you guys can look, knows or can look that up. Tell me in the chat. Um, it says large, sharp twist here. Now, I would call this a lightning bolt myself, you know. Um, it's it's really sort of a Ziggy Stardust kind of, of hat. And I... I've been thinking about it ever since I got this block, how to block on this thing because it's got such sharp points here. And I'm reminded of a um, one time when I was teaching millinery class to my graduate students and we talked about um, the, the process of, of hand sculpting felt on a head block, which is, you know, a canvas head shape and you can pleat and fold it and, and do wonderful, beautiful sculptural things that way. But I also talked about applying those techniques of manipulating the felt or the straw in folds and pleats as you block on a block form and how you can get interesting areas of dimensionality and texture doing that. Um, so I wonder if, especially because this says large, sharp twist, whether what you're supposed to do with this is sort of use it as a matrix on which you then sculpt something much more ornate than this lightning bolt. Arlene says in the Insta, er, in the uh, YouTube chat, it really makes me think of some of the more outre 1930s hats. And that's a very good point. It's, it's really kind of, it, it reminds me almost of like a disco Chaparelli. You know, like she is the designer that did that famous hat an inverted shoe on your head and the heel sort of pokes out this way. Um, I could imagine her coming up with something really interesting to do with this hat, with this block rather. Um, I also noted when I received this block that it has two peg holes on the bottom, which um, I'm not familiar with blocks that have two holes like that. Um, if I block down here. I have a, a block under here to show you. Predominantly, at least all of the ones I've seen, have one hole that the peg of a hat spinner goes into to stabilize it and then you can rotate it around that peg. I've never seen one with these two peg holes. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm just one person who's only made so many hats in my time. It's possible that that's a different convention. Uh, that I know nothing about. So the goal today is to block on this. Oh, I want to check out. There are more people that I don't recognize waving at me in Instagram. Hi, everyone. And, and I have a, a new person joining us at YouTube. My account has gone up by one there. So um, welcome, everybody. My name is Rachel Pollock. This is my open studio stream. So I was talking about this block, which um, I think my students probably voted on this because we've already covered hat blocking in my class. 
And so they're familiar with the process. And I imagine that they, much like I, am, am puzzled with how you block on a, a block like this. And this is made more complex by virtue of the medium that I'm using. I actually know how I would block on this if I was blocking it in felt. If it was flat felt or I had cut a section of a, a hat body to, to use on this, I'm, I'm confident that I could block felt on this shape. Even with these sharp points, I could figure out how to reconcile that. But I'm working with straw cloth which is a medium that we don't really use much in the theater. So I'm a theatrical milliner. Often what I'm making is recreating the millinery styles of, of yesteryear, as it were, you know, whatever the costume designer has created, when whatever time period the theater has set the play in, then I'm replicating the techniques that milliners were using in that time period Except I'm also taking into consideration like this hat gets ripped off her head and stomped on every night or whatever. That I'm problem solving and I'm looking back to uh, the techniques and materials that were used in the past and I'm either using them myself or I'm coming up with alternatives that, that are perhaps more technologically advanced that we could use now. Um, because certainly if you had a, a blocked straw hat that had to get ripped off somebody's head and stomped on every night, you couldn't do that with actual straw. Uh, but I would probably use the raffia cloth now is uh, actually a polypropylene fiber that it's woven from. And it approximates straw really nicely, but it's really durable. And if you step on it, it will, you know, you can just refresh it and it becomes uh, crisp and nice again. So... If that was the problem, that would be what I would try, is, is something that looked like straw, but did not remotely splinter and crush like straw. So, when I posted about this to my Instagram story, and people were voting, what I said, the, the two options were Regency Bonnet, which is this spiral straw over here. Oh, I have a comment, someone asking me a question. Uh, Oh, this is, uh, this is Trisha. Hey, Trisha. Trisha from Creative Costume Academy. She teaches online pattern making classes. Very excellent. She says, we have to think about so many things in the theater. And it's true. You, there, you, can, you can know exactly how to sew like a 1930s dress, but can you sew a dress that somebody can rip it off her in a comedy moment and it's not actually getting torn? Um, you got to think up how to solve that problem in a way that the audience is never going to know. They're going to be like, oh my God, they, they tore that dress off of her. But if you use strategically placed Velcro, it'll sound like they've ripped it off when they rip it off, but then it can be reassembled for every subsequent show. Um, God, we do have to solve some weird problems. <laughs> oh, it looks like I have. I have, I'm just going to, the caveat, I have really bad eyesight, so um, it's, I, I can see the chat in both of these, but but it's it's kind of a strain on Instagram because you guys are a little bit farther away than normal for this stream because I, I need the physical real estate of the table in order to do this process. So uh, normally I you guys would be about a foot closer to me and I'd, I'd have a better chance of being able to read what you're saying. I can see you guys on YouTube great because I've pumped up the, the size of the chat over there, but on Instagram, it's they limit you to your phone. So it's just however big my phone screen is and then the distance. So I apologize. I'm gonna be kind of slow responding to you all there. Um, but certainly if you sign on to YouTube and just comment in the chat, which Trisha noticed last time that you have to have a YouTube account in order to comment in the chat there, so that may be a stumbling block for some folks. I apologize about that. Um, the difference between the two streams, you're all sort of basically in the same place now. I figured out the setup of the camera so I can address you at the same time, and it's not. Instagram was way over here the first time I streamed on it, and then it was hard to, to switch to both audiences, but now I think I've figured out how to configure it so that I'm just talking to everybody at the same time. Um, but the difference is you're on the phone portrait mode on Instagram, and then you have a broader uh, view here on, Insta on, on YouTube Live where you can see the entire work table. You can see you know the basket behind me that has the, well, I guess you can see that 
on YouTube as, or on Instagram Live as well. Anyway, I'm going off track. Um, I was talking about the material that I'm going to use for this because I would be pretty confident uh, blocking on this in felt. So when you block in felt, I would have to come up with, I would probably need a piece of flat fur felt or wool felt, which I do have at Playmakers in our storage there. Um, some fur felt skirting, which is a flat fabric they used to make poodle skirts out of in the 50s. And um, a, a couple of pieces of flat felt there that I could use to do this. And as a matter of fact, once I'm able to safely be back in the space again, I will probably reblock this whole hat concept. Well, or I'll just use this block again and use, there's a lovely piece of flat felt that is a sort of a heathered gold that I think would be really nice on this weird lightning bolt shape. We talked about, um, when I bought this, I, I talked with some milliner, f some friends who are fellow milliners about how how you wear this hat like once once it exists like it, it, this can't be it this can't be it you know is it something that it, i suspect that that the intent of the block maker was that it would be uh, one of those sort of contemporary racing hats that are at a very sharp angle and and there would probably be feathers or stripped quills or something that that shot out of the end of it i don't know um but then i also had this interesting idea of what would happen if you blocked it in uh cinema straw which cinema is i'll show you in a minute i've got some over here it's a, a straw that is very uh open weave and it's it looks almost like buckram but it's made from abaca fiber which that's a fiber that comes from the hemp plant. Um, it's grown in the Philippines, and a lot of a lot of um, if you follow, perhaps you do. I actually follow fashionable Filipinas on Instagram, and a lot of the um, traditional clothes that you see in these images from the 19th century and stuff, really beautiful pictures of women in traditional garments and uh, clothing shapes that are made out of abaca fiber cloth and cinnamon straw. But we use it in millinery to make hats. And well, let me just get this piece of it so I can illustrate what I'm talking about when I'm thinking about how, how do you wear this thing? So can you see this? It, this is a piece of black cinnamon. It's flat. It's uh, about a yard wide from selvage to selvage. There you can see the selvage on this end. And here's the cut edge, sold by the yard, or it's sold in rolls. Um, I actually, most of the, the cinema that I own, I bought it from a floral supply shop in New York City called Jamali Garden. Let's hope they're still open through this pandemic or that they will reopen if they're closed. Um, they're a wholesaler that caters to the floral industry and florists use cinema in creating bows and, and decorative elements on large floral arrangements. And you can also get interesting cinema trims and ribbons at floral supply places. So if you buy cinema from a floral supply, supplier, it's usually sold in a roll and it's uh, a, about five dollars for a roll whereas if you're buying it by the yard from the millinery supply house you're paying you know i think i paid 13 dollars a yard for for this one piece here which is about a yard and a half long but the property that i want you to notice here as we're looking at this cinema is how incredibly see-through it is like i can completely cover my face with it and you still can see me in here talking right and often milliners will use cinema to make you'll see racing hats you know really interesting blocked shapes if you follow uh the hats that show up in fashion relating to ascot and the kentucky derby and stuff really more ascot and british wedding hats cinema is really popular um at least summer weddings and so the fact that you can see through it 
I think is an interesting property when you see blocked hats made out of it for say a wedding they will often use two layers of it in order to to give it some more oomph I guess but I wondered <laughs> in thinking about this thing like my original concept the reason I ordered this stuff in the first place Oh, I gotta say, my cat just came in the room, so I'm just gonna apologize for his uh, presence in a moment. Or I'm just gonna preemptively apologize because he likes to jump up on this table. And there's now there's all these interesting pieces of straw cloth floating around the room that he's like really super excited about. Riley, Riley, don't do that. Don't do that, buddy. Oh, now he's really scared. It's okay, kitty. It's okay. <laughs> See, he's really neurotic. Uh, even before the pandemic, but he really can, can feel our stress levels and, and he's been really stressed out ever since the lockdown began. Also because suddenly we're home all the time and he's used to having some alone time in the middle of the day. So he's been a lot more scared and freaked out about just like that piece of straw cloth just fell off the bed and he skedaddled. Um, so I, I try to be kind to him about that sort of stuff. Um, but back to the project at hand... I was thinking if I can get this cinema to take this form then could it function as kind of a mask hat like is it something that especially you could you could have it be mounted like this to where you see through one side of this and it's 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 it becomes then um kind of interestingly piratical um except really totally not. Um, so that was kind of my original thinking was that I would block a double layer of black cinema on this thing and then play around with orientation on the face. But then, then Judith M. Millinery Supply, which if you are, if you're a milliner, you are probably familiar with them. Um, that is a business that is based in, I believe they're in Indiana. Um, and Judith is a milliner and, and she sells supp millinery supplies and, um, she had a sale one weekend in which she was offering something called Pinock Pock, which is also an Abaca fiber straw cloth, uh, but it is, um, it's hammered. The fibers are hammered when they strip them out of the hemp plant. And it makes them very reflective and very flat. And see, when I bring this up here and show it to you, it's it's going to be deceptive because um, I ordered a, a yard of it. And here it is. Now, what you're seeing here, this the, the reflectivity here, the metallic nature of this is not the Pinnock Pock fiber. That is a metallic lurex thread that is woven into the cloth and so that it's it's like a cross weave like there are black straw fibers and then there are these metallic gold fibers. So she had this stuff for sale, uh, on sale rather, and I'd never worked with it before. I've never even touched it before so I thought well this is my chance. I'm going to buy a yard of that and maybe maybe it works like cinema. I can block it on this um, lightning bolt thing. And it got here and I, um, when I touched it, the hand of it, it's, it's nice. I mean, it's, it's really nice. And, and it, like when you, it doesn't crack, it doesn't splinter. And when you fold it up, it does some interesting things with complex curvature. When you pull it on the bias, it stretches. You know, it's, it's really cool material. Now that I own some and have touched it, I have all kinds of exciting ideas for what I can do with it. Um, but I'm not sure whether it would block nicely. Um, I mean, I, I can I can try. That's the goal. The 
one difference that I notice when I received this Pinock Pock, and I was thinking it's, it, I was thinking it's just. It's got to be just like cinnamé because they're made of the same fiber from the same plant. You probably work with them the same way, except cinnamé cloth has... Oh, I see Jennifer Mormon is in the Instagram um, chat. Hey, welcome. So she is um, a former student. She audited uh, at least one of my millinery classes, audited my millinery class. I think she audited some other classes through our graduate program. And she used to be based um, west of here, but also still in North Carolina. Um, I, somebody has commented in the Instagram chat, hi, it can be stiffened. Yes, it can be stiffened, um, uh, the Pinock Pock. You can size it, but it doesn't have integrated stiffener the way that the, the um, Cinema does. So Cinema, I have, this spray bottle here because in thinking about working with cinnamon I, you you usually mist it it becomes malleable you form it you tack it and then when it dries it becomes more rigid again and then you do whatever stabilization you're going to do you know stitch the edge wrap it wrap it over a wire etc so i got this when i was setting up for this um, session i got this out thinking, oh, well, I will probably need this to activate the Pinock Pock, not knowing that it doesn't have an integrated stiffener involved. And that, as um, Mad Hatter Millinery says in the, in the YouTube chat, you yourself have to stiffen it after the fact. And so that sort of means that I need to rethink what I'm doing with this project. Um, and I need to do some samples because when I bought this, metallic pinock pock from um judith m millinery and i was thinking about this lightning bolt block here i didn't um i didn't think through what sort of sizing i might need for it i i looked around online and um i found some references to people using essentially what is diluted white glue um which sounds like a good option. I've used that as sizing on other types of straw. It works wonderfully. It, it, well, it it's not reversible, really, but um, that works decently. Um, but I would want to do samples of any type of sizing that I'm gonna use on this to see how it might impact the reflectivity of the metallic aspect of this piece of material. So. I said blocking in Pinock Pock, but I'm actually going to go back to my original plan of cinema. Um, and one thing that I want to do first in uh, approaching this challenging block project is uh, strategize some ways that I plan to reconcile these corners. Because, um, you know, if, if I'm blocking, I'm, I'm pulling the medium over the planes of this surface and then the way that this block has been carved you pull the material to the underside and tack it down and then you know trim away your excess and then once you take it off the block after you size it or stiffen it then you reconcile it then i think though with straw, I'm concerned about how incredibly pointy this is. I think I could figure it out in felt uh, because you can kind of, you know, steamy felt, you can roll it in your fingers and you can get it to be a sharp point. Um, that's not true with straw cloth. And so it, what I may discover is that this is just a, a, a bad marriage of block and material and maybe you just well, you, I, will just have to come up with some different way to deal with that. But I was thinking before I cut up my material that I would do some manipulations with, I have a piece of brown paper here, craft scissors. Um, I normally have my fancier scissors. Like the, if you've been to any of these other uh, studio streams, I have a, a fancier pair of scissors 
that I tend to use for cutting like really high-end ribbon, um, cloth, so forth. But when it comes to something like brown paper or how relatively coarse these pieces of straw cloth are, I'm not going to use my nice fabric scissors to do that when I can use my good craft scissors. I'm not such a stickler about uh, scissors that I'm going to, you know, freak out and kill somebody if they use my fabric scissors to open an envelope. But um, I think people tend to get super uptight about stuff when it's like, about specifically fabric scissors when it's like, as far as I'm concerned, just take it to the sharpener. I mean... Worst case, make them reimburse you for the cost of resharpening them. Like, it's scissors, okay? There's a global pandemic. There's bigger things to worry about right now. Um, but that's just me, you know? If you get uptight about people using your scissors, you, that's your right. And um, ask them to respect your property. Um, I do see that there's a question for later consideration. Uh, kudzu fabric. So, oh, do you use nylon net for anything? Yes, we do. We use it for lots of different things. And your suggestion of kudzu fabric and fiber as creating a cloth, straw cloth from which you could create hats is, is very interesting to me. So if, if you're not familiar with kudzu, that is a basic parasitic weed that we have here in the South. It's extremely fast growing and extremely um, strong. It will, like if it grows over an abandoned barn, it will pull it down. It's, it's, it's crazy. Look up some pictures. If you Google kudzu, you'll find some, some weird landscapes. I'll tell you what. Um, but that, that is a really interesting suggestion. And I wonder who could be the place that would manufacture such a thing. Um, I, I would like to look into that further. Um, I have, so I have my piece of paper here that is slightly larger than my block. See, And my thought was that I can figure out how I'm going to deal with the how I'm going to deal with the folds and curves that have to happen in this thing. And I'm going to have to hide. Oh, that's good. I'm going to have to hide a fold in the blocking. So if you can see what I've done here, I've got creases that go down the four ridges of this block and then I have this extra that if I push it up in here and fold it down it hits right where this crease on the inside of the lightning bolt comes in. Um, oh Arlene mentions in uh, YouTube that kudzu is also invasive that's right it is it's not native to the area I believe it came from Ooh, somewhere in Asia. I don't want to just pick a country. Um, but it, it came from abroad, was brought here inadvertently, and, and it has really, it just loves the South, particularly the climate and the humidity and stuff. Um, I haven't seen kudzu all over America, but we definitely have loads of it here in the South. So that is an interesting piece of information that I've just uh, discovered in, in this mock-up with the brown paper is that I can can hide a fold in my cinema so it could either leave all of that material in there and wind up with a triple layer of cinema on this patch and single layers on these others um, or I suppose I could trim some of that away and then reconcile the the sort of dart over itself i'm inclined to say though that i'm interested in retaining that retaining that triple thickness of cinema right here 
because if I'm going to do a single layer cinema, then if if you look at if you look at the block, then I would have a single layer on these panels of the lightning bolt and a triple layer here on this one. So there'd be opacity here and transparency in the rest of these. And that's pretty interesting to me from a, from a design perspective, um, that could be pretty cool. And um, then if I was gonna, if my plan had been to be making a double layer cinema, then I could artfully arrange it so that the next, when I put the next layer on, I don't have the same one tripled up. So now there's six layers there. Perhaps I rotate it and I do it over on this one. So we have opacity here and double layer cinema here. Um, or maybe I do it on the panel that is adjacent to my triple layer and you have opacity here and transparency in the rest of this. Um, I don't know, that, that will happen when I start doing the real thing, but I'm, I'm still kind of interested in working with paper as a, a mock-up way of doing this because I don't want, for one thing, like right now during the pandemic, um, I've ordered this cinema and I only have so much. I can only screw it up so many times. I mean, actually, so I could probably screw it up once, but you know, um, my students presented uh, millinery projects today and I had uh, one in particular who was unable to present their project because the materials that they ordered for it didn't arrive until literally yesterday because the postal service here in the U.S. has been disrupted by um, the election and mail-in ballots and so they they just didn't have their stuff in time to, to finish for the projected due date which I mean like, as far as I'm concerned, this semester, like, due dates are out the window. I really, you know, if you can, if you can complete something by that scheduled meeting, then great. But if not, no sweat, you know, make some hats eventually by the end of the semester, right? The weird times tell you that, um, so I... Also, what I want to do with this mock-up is figure out how to reconcile these corners. Oh, you know what I wish I had? I wish I had some tape. You know what? I'm going to go get tape because I also forgot to bring my tacks in here. Um, so I'm going to put the B right back on YouTube. I can't do that on Instagram. You're just going to have to look at this empty room. Maybe the cat will walk by, but I got to go into the next room and get tape and tacks. I'll be right back. say really quick with respect to these blocking tacks. I, I, I've seen a lot of um, conversations in uh, professional forums online for professional milliners, primarily Facebook groups, um, and a, a couple of those for milliners, and um, there's a certain amount of um, debate over whether you should use um, steel blocking pins, which are essentially just like dressmakers pins, but they're made out of stainless steel or um, quilt pins, which I have some of those. Those are, are these, uh, these pins here with the yellow heads. Um, or I like these steel drafting tacks. 
and um, I've been reading uh, folks who are proponents of the steel pins saying um, valid criticism of, of these drafting pins that the post on the tack is so much thicker than the post on the steel pin and that, so they leave bigger holes in your wooden block or your foam block and it causes them to deteriorate quicker which is valid that is true um, I like these pens because we use them in um, pattern drafting or at least we do at our costume shop um, we use them in pattern drafting we use them to pin out patterns on that we have court top tables um, they they're around and there's they're plentiful and they're easy to find um, so I have always just used them because they were there. I'm interested in the idea of steel pins as blocking pins, and especially that they would leave uh, less of a scar on the material and less of a scar on the block. Um, but that said, I don't own any, and I need to, to find some to try them out. So criticism aside, I, I, I don't... Um, I don't object to these uh, to these steel tacks. So there's that. Now, I, <laughs> it's it's funny when you work in theatrical millinery. There, there's a lot of pronouncements I, I have found uh, theatrical costuming in general. There's a lot of pronouncements about the way things are supposed to be done, or what is the quality, the best quality way to do something, and that is all certainly excellent to consider if you have the time and the money and the, the um, skill to do things at the best possible way. In theater, the one variable that we don't have control over is time. And so often you might know of a better way to do something, but it wouldn't be done in time for opening night, so it kind of doesn't matter. You gotta figure out how to do the best you can in the time that you have in order to make your deadline, because that's always the, the most important thing. The tickets have been sold, the audience is coming, people need to have clothes on, uh, unless it's a different kind of show. So, I've got I've got my, my shape pinned out now and my, my little dart secured in here. And I what I want to do is reconcile how I'm going to deal with turning under the edge after I block the cinema into this shape. Because, I mean, you saw it, cinema is so loose of a weave that if I, if I cut down into it, like I'd be inclined if this were felt, to just cut down to this point and fold the flaps over, which, let me just go ahead and do that since this is paper, it doesn't matter. If it were felt, my plan would be to put a cut in the material like that, and then I can fold it over here, secure it down, size it, and then when I take it off the block, that's, that's fine. Um, I don't know though, if I cut cinema all the way down to the point at which it uh, would fold in two different directions, I think I will lose some structural integrity there. So as I'm, as I'm working on this paper pattern of this, I may be discovering that my goal of making this hat in straw cloth on this hat block is a fool's errand. Like perhaps there's not a way to, to do it without losing the structural integrity of the material. So oh man. I misplaced the paper. But I'm I, I'm still learning things out of this, so that is an unfortunate element of this sample that is something to be aware of when I go in, if I go into the cinema material. Because, see, in positioning it, somehow I, I positioned it just a little bit too far to be able to reconcile this sharp corner. But I can 
figure out this sharp corner. So for the purposes of this just being an exercise of exploration of the material, it's fine. Let me cut some of that away. So I always try to do test runs like this in something, you know, that is low cost, low pressure. If I screw it up, it's just garbage. Like this is just brown paper. It, it was free. I've started saving all of the brown packing paper that comes in packages since everything now gets shipped because we can't really go shopping at the mall um, due to the pandemic. I think that some happy accident that came about with the result of this uh, dart in the pattern here is that I think I can I think I can separate it if I clip it up to the edge there and have one part of the cinema block towards this side and then the other three which I want to cut that down other three layers yeah this is good okay see I'm learning things um, the other three layers go this direction still kind of jammed up about that point there but we'll figure it out I'm gonna get some of the excess off of here and what I'll have after I figure out this whole thing once I do this sample version in brown paper and then I'll take it off the block and and I will have essentially like a pseudo pattern piece so I know exactly how much I'm going to cut out of my cinema or my pinock pock um, and I, I will just have less waste which is good because those are they're not super expensive they're not like you know espartery or something but they're not cheap and I why waste it if you don't have to so anyway I'm doing pretty well. I've figured out a lot that I, I just didn't know when I saw this thing about how to approach blocking it. But the moment of truth is really figuring out this super pointy end here. And if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take my glasses off and really get in here. I think I want to put this down. Oh, this would be so great in felt. That is a note to self. Do this block in felt as soon as you get back to work and have all the free time, you know, that we normally have in the theater. <laughs> I think that... I think that I can take a dart Clip most of the bulk away. Yeah, that's doing it. This is a tough problem. I think what this may be telling me is that this block is excellent, excellent, excellent for. Um, Ooh, I lost the tack. I don't want to accidentally sit on it later. <gasps> Found it. Okay. That was not a, a gasp of stabbing myself. That was a gasp of excitement that I found it. Um, okay. And then I, I do have a section here that I have to roll back on itself, which I, I have, haven't worked with cinema much. I, I think I started talking about this at the beginning of the stream. I haven't worked in this material, uh, straw cloth in general, except for raffia cloth, very much, um, because it has a very um, late 20th century, 21st century, contemporary racing hats, British wedding hats aesthetic to it, which we don't have much call for in the theater. Um, I have really only made, blocked, and sculpted two hats in cinema. 
And in both cases, it was just a, a personal um, enrichment exercise of I just want to explore how this material works. So um, it's, it is an interesting material to work with, but as a theatrical milliner, most of the time, like if I'm making something in straw, it's a straw hat body or it's spiral straw braid, like the Regency bonnet behind me, or perhaps it is, um, I guess I could imagine, like I, I talked about the idea of using cinema to make this like a mask and it's something that you can then see through. Um, but really, if we need that type of a, 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 a mesh over, say, an eye hole in a mask, <coughs> Excuse me. I really need to take a drink of water. If you need that sort of obfuscative dark mask of what's behind there so you don't see the eyes of the wearer through the mask itself or, you know, if it's put like the ghost of Christmas yet to come, there's often a, a mask of black buckram over the performer's face so that it looks like there's just nobody in there. Oh, and I'm silly. Athena is in the, the YouTube channel stream. She's one of my graduate students currently. Um, and she's the one that said it's invasive. Ha, ah, eyesight. Welcome, Athena. I'm glad to see you here. Um, I, but I was talking about Buckram versus Cinema. So generally, if you need have a place where the performer can see through but the audience can't see the performer's features you'd use black buckram instead of cinema um, so I haven't worked with it that much like I, I know the principles I've taken some workshops I've made it like I said a couple of hats with it just for my own edification um, and my sense from having fiddling with it and now having done this mock-up version, which if, if you look on, on the inside, ooh, my tack fell out. Let me put it back in here. If you look on the inside, I had to clip into that in a couple places quite close to the actual edge of the hat. And then I've rolled up material, stacked it quite thick here on the one sharp point that I was able to reconcile. So when I take this off of here, I will have essentially a paper pattern for what I would cut out of a different material to block on this zigzag here. Um, but I think as I've talked out loud to myself and to you guys, thinking about the properties of cinema as I know it and the properties of Pinot Pock as I've observed it here, having now received a length of it for the first time. I do not think that this shape lends itself well to those, to executing in those materials. I think that the properties of those materials, I would have to come up with ways to solve huge problems that really, if I need a, a area of a black grid that can be seen through, then I would block this in black buckram because that's what is going to remain more structural. It, it's not totally structurally intact. If you clip into it, you do get fraying in the weave of buckram, but it, it has a lot more structural integrity than, um, than cinema. So this has all been a, a very long, uh, experiment in which I ultimately come to the conclusion that I I don't want to do what the original plan was because in my sample version here with the brown paper I think that I would be trying to trying to force the material to do something that goes against its natural properties and I said I said that back in one of the very first streams that I did, that I had an early millinery professor, that, that that was a piece of advice I have remembered my whole career, is to pay attention to what the material wants to do, what it does well. And if you come to an area of resistance where you want it to do something that it just doesn't seem to want to do, then let the material tell you what it should do next. Like abandon your conviction that I'm going to get this to take a complex curve 
because if it's not structurally able to do that, then you need to figure out a way to, to do that that will work with the properties of the material. So like take a complex curve. So that's like when you have a sideband of a top hat that swoops in and then back out and it's like a parabola has gone in a, in a, a circle and you've, you've got, it's like a nuclear reactor shape, right? If you try to take a weave of fabric that doesn't have much give across the bias and get it to take that kind of curve or stretch, you can do it with stretch as well. If you get it to take that kind of curve, you're actually gonna be better off putting pleats into it because it'll, it'll want to, you'll see drag lines, you'll see bubbles and wrinkles and, and that's not attractive. Uh, but if you put tucks and pleats into it, then you can get it to take that curve. It just won't be smooth and sleek. It will now become a feature, which is another aspect of millinery that I appreciate is if there's something that you're like, oh, this is looking ugly, there's bubbly drag lines here, then come up with a beautiful piece of trim and cover it. And nobody will ever know that the ugly part where it just wouldn't do what you needed it to do is under that element of the trim. So in today's, um, in today's presentations that my students did, um, sorry, I'm getting hoarse. In today's presentations that my students did, one of them was making a foss shaped cap on which the presentations were uh, hairstyle uh, shapes using millinery techniques and materials. And um, this one student had created a foss shaped cap that she was then uh, going to build basically balls of yarn and knitting needles to look like a giant bouffant. It was really creative, it was lovely. Hi, it's Jim Millinery in, and, and Felix Weber. Hello, and uh, Instagram TV, which um, those are some, some other IG friends of mine. Glad to see you showing up uh, for today's Open Studio stream. Anyway, this student had created a base uh, skull cap out of stiff and foss shape, and she had put too much ease into it. So when she applied the steam and pressure, there got to be areas that were wrinkled, that looked kind of like when you wrinkle your forehead, like you're puzzled at something. If the, there's an area of the cap that, that had these wrinkles on it. Now, you, you could say, who cares about that? Because you're gonna pile a whole bunch of stuff on top of it, and that's valid. Um, but what she did was um, cut into it, trim away the part that didn't do what she wanted it to do, abutted the new two edges of foss shape, zigged and, and reapplied pressure and steam. And um, essentially it, it wound up looking kind of like a, a surgery scar. But the bulk and the weirdness of the wrinkles were gone. That is a huge digression and isn't even related to what inspired me to start talking about it. Now I see um, from the clock that we're at 3, uh, 357 and the stream ends at 4 p.m. It will definitely end on Instagram Live because they cut you off. Um, it, I won't cut you guys off who are on the YouTube channel. Uh, but I, I do need to end on time today. I have some other things I need to get done with the rest of the afternoon. But what we have ultimately, this, it, I, I, had, I had these high hopes that I was going to block this thing and have this. This is always true. I'm always thinking I will get done and I'll be able to move on and even do some of my Regency bonnet. Well, no. Um, I just got far enough to, to figure out what my, my pattern is. So this rough shape here is what I would need to cut out of, uh, or I need at least this much of whatever material I would, I would use to block on this lightning bolt block. Um, I have determined that I definitely don't want to use Cinema because the properties of the material um, don't lend themselves well to this shape. They're great for, for Curves like I'm, I made a, a hat out of cinema that it looked kind of like a Pringles potato chip. You know, it was it was curved this way, but also curved this way, um, and it was cream cinema, and the edge was bound in um, a sort of a navy. 
a silk with a lurex silver thread that shot through it. It was really beautiful. Um, but that was a great application. It was this potato chip shape that I could bind the edge, wire the edge, and just graceful curves. These have such sharp points that I think it's, it's an exercise in futility. But now I, I do have um, the added information of how much material I need straight up in order to create this block. And I have a better idea of what type of material I would want to use to do that. Oh. I think my I think my Instagram just died. Yeah, so that was the alarm. It's four o'clock. It's time to stop my stream. Um, thanks for coming today. There were so many new faces. I'm really excited to have had all of you here for my studio stream. I'm sorry that I didn't get anything actually blocked on this other than a sheet of paper, but. I hope that's been a good illustration of how you don't want to dive right into a medium that you are perhaps not hugely familiar with. Because, you know, in a theater, I can't get enough lifelong practice with any one material to feel like I'm actually a master at it. Uh, you always have to uh, get what experience you can as the job presents you with projects. And so I am still a fairly novice cinema blocker, but I, I do know enough that I'm not going to attempt to do this shape in it. So, good information gained in today's uh, session, even though I don't have any kind of product to show you that we'll move on next week. Actually, next week we probably could go back to the Regency bonnet, or perhaps um, if I can find, I've ordered some vintage 1950s felt circle skirts that are stained. And if those arrive, then I will have flat skirting felt to, to try this. But neither here nor there. Thank you so much for coming to my stream today. If you haven't subscribed to my channel and you'd like to get notifications for when these happen, it's every Thursday at 3 p.m., but, you know, who can remember that kind of stuff? If it's not on your calendar or you don't get a ding from... Um, YouTube. So you can subscribe. You can click on the bell if you want those notifications. I'm also on Instagram live every Thursday. So if you want to just serendipitously drop in over there, you can find me there as well. Thanks for coming, Jennifer, a Athena, Arlene, and all the folks on Instagram that I've just lost and maybe um, Mad Hatter Millinery. Anyone who hasn't spoken in the chat. Um, it's been great having you all here. And I've loved your input and your contributions to the chat. Oh, Arlene says, mistakes just show us what doesn't work so we uh, can try what will. That's correct. Yes, let me make the mistakes so you don't have to. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end this stream. I'll see you guys hopefully next week. And thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.